Hello everyone and welcome to the first of many game audio sessions where we'll be giving you an introduction to the fundamentals of interactive audio and why's. My name is Greg Lester, uh, most of you know me already. I um, work as a sound designer for a company called Soundcuts um, and I'm also the founder of the Game Audio Learning Portal and the Game Audio Analysis YouTube channel and with me today I have Prashant. Hi everyone, my name is Prashant. Uh, I have been working like as a sound director uh, in an educational based company in, uh, in India. And one of my like the recent projects was collaboration with Disney for their interactive games and videos for educational uh, content. Uh, and I also do a lot of audio application development. And one of my recent uh, project was creating the integration between Soundly and Wise. Uh, and Wise is something that we'll check in today's session. So yeah, I'm excited uh, to see all of you here and. Uh, hope to see have a great session. So what is the angle with all of this? So basically we want to create a ongoing live course to really help you build your technical sound design skills as well as develop the mindset of a game sound designer, which basically will uh, let you create audio systems in WISE from scratch based on a brief. So what does that mean? Well, in technical terms, that means that we'll be able to give you um, a huge palette of sounds, for example, and then you'll be able to um, create a system based on uh, instructions. So for example, let's say we have a first person shooter and we want um, a um, automatic rifle that can also shoot single fire and in burst, we have a a uh, grenade launcher, we want the sounds to uh, change based on the distance. We also want to have three different reverb tails, one in a big space inside, one in a small space inside, and one in a um, in an open space. The end goal is for you to be able to go away and, and do these things all by yourself. How are we going to do this? Well, it's similar to building a wall. I obviously love my analogies, so I'm going to pack full of them in, in this presentation. <laughs> so we're going to learn the theory first, and those are basically our bricks. And then we really want to solidify that with practical applications, with it being the mortar, so to speak. So a really good way to kind of learn all of this stuff is to follow along with these courses, whether you're doing it uh, live or um, whether you're watching this at home. Um, after the live presentation and then to actually follow along with the tasks that we give because then you'll actually be able to solidify that knowledge in practical terms. Yeah, I think uh, uh, just to add to that, uh, the, the main idea for this session is to have hands-on training experience, right? Uh, a lot of times uh, when uh, people watch tutorials, uh, it's it's more of like this is how it's done. But the aim here is to make sure that uh, you all do uh, a lot. You you learn by doing, and that's also kind of uh, helpful if you are going to take up the uh, one one zero certification in uh, Wise. So yeah, that's that's the overall aim. Like you do things, and then you learn. Exactly. And then the the question is though, like why should we learn implementation in the first place? So. Uh, Another beautiful analogy is really like, what's the purpose of the most amazing sound if it doesn't play? And so I like to um, use a lamp as, as an analogy for this. You can have sound designers or actually lamp designers, so to speak, that make beautiful, incredible chandeliers. And yeah, no, they're super, super bright. But if there's no power and there's no plug, they don't serve any purpose really, except for being decorative. So you could kind of see the sound designers as being the lamp designers and the technical sound designers as being the electricians and setting the cables and everything. So we're kind of bridging that gap. We are not going to go full technical sound design, but we'll be able to give you the means to plug in that lamp to make it shine. In other words, make the sound play. 
Yeah, exactly. I uh, and I think uh, uh, Greg, uh, a lot of times when it comes to uh, learning implementation, right, it also helps in doing creative collaboration with other departments. So, for example, the game designers would be thinking a, a specific approach. Uh, the the people who are doing the coding stuff would would have their own, own approach in mind. So, knowing a little bit of implementation also helps understand their language. Uh, so yeah, I think this is also a very strong point why learning implementation is one of the most relevant thing when it comes to game and interactive audio. For sure. Um, so as we said, we're not going to go full um, technical sound designer, but implementation also informs the design of the sounds by knowing what our tools are, what the limitations of the tools and the systems are, and how the sound will be played back we can then go and use that information and create the sounds in the DAW to fit the systems. It's again, similar to if you're building a machine and you're making cogs and those cogs don't really fit together then, or, or you're building a house and the, the bricks are bigger than the measurements, then the walls will stand out at one side. So this is the same thing. It's why the implementation is important so that we can actually make things to the desired measurements, so to speak, to, to the system specifications. And you also have a lot more control over your sound. So for example, if you're, if you're a composer and you can create the score to be adaptive and basically you can already say, oh, I think it should be implemented this way, then obviously you'll have way more um, control over how it will sound in the game versus you just make some stuff and then send it off and then see what happens. And the last thing is it's super duper fun to come up with systems. It really opens new doors to be able to um, actually do technical sound design and to make your ideas come to life. And you don't have to do this in game engines. You can do so much just within WISE from a prototyping and design perspective. I mean, there's really endless limitations, uh, sorry, endless possibilities. It does have some limitations, but I think those only add to kind of um, being able to be more creative. So we have now linear versus interactive media. Obviously, this is a huge one, and I'm sure there's a bunch of people here that are from the linear media side of things or who have started in the film uh, audio kind of and post-production spheres and are now trying to get into the interactive scene. And there are a bunch of similarities, but there are also huge differences. So I'm just going to go through some of them here. So obviously the first one is that linear media stays the same each time. It is synchronized to the video perfectly. It doesn't have to change. It's no matter how you play it back, it's the same. We also have things that are audio to do lists. I love to define them as that. And that's kind of like, what, what is the audio supposed to do when we design it for that? And for picture, the two main or three main objectives are really to enhance the narrative and give the listener information about what's happening on screen and off screen as well. So if you have an ax murder and you're in a horror film, and then you hear that like in your back speaker that there's a door opening that's obviously information but then also makes it immersive and scary and and all of that so that's the third thing that i didn't write down here interactive media on the other hand always changes based on the player actions so if we have that same horror um axe murder thing but this time it's a game you can choose to then run away or stay or turn around and look at where the sound is coming from and all of these things. So you have to account basically for all of these scenarios. It's like if you're doing a racing game, okay, all of a sudden, what if the player decides to drive into another car or in the wall? We need sounds for all of that. We need behaviors for all of that. What if it drives and scrapes the wall? And so all of these things need potential scenarios for the player to, to be um, able to do that. Then on the audio to-do list of things, we also have enhanced the narrative, which is the more emotional aspect. Listener information, where are the enemies, for example, or where's the bad guy? But then also there's the third one, which is providing the player with feedback. And feedback is when we press a button, for example, then we really want to hear something. So if you're shooting a gun, you want to you wanna get that wonderful juicy feedback of the gun going doof, 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 doof. And, and also then we have the happy haptic feedback with that which is mm -hmm. awesome um to then put the sound into a physical realm 
and oftentimes the sound designers are also responsible or partially responsible for haptic feedback so it can be a really really cool tool but we're not going to go into that today the third huge thing here is that assets need to go into the game this is a huge process there's jobs for it there's um, yeah, entire career paths, right? So you have to plan uh, on how you're going to implement the sound. Then the sound needs to be designed to match the implementation plan. Like I said, you need to match the measurements, otherwise it won't fit, so to speak. Um, so for example, if you have, a, again, a, a, um, a gun system and you say you have, want to have single fire and automatically automatic fire, how are you going to do that? Are you going to do it with a single first shot in a loop or will it be multiple shots that will be playing after one another so there's kind of lots of thought process that has to go behind that um then the sounds need to be implemented into the middleware so in this case wise or the game engine directly if you're not using middleware and then you need to create a hook for the audio event to trigger so the audio event basically houses the sound then and then you need to play test it to make sure it even works in the first place right because and and if it sounds good as well, because once the sound is in the game, oftentimes it turns out that, oh, it doesn't quite fit the context. So yeah, lots of things to consider right there. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, uh, when it comes to the interactive media, uh, one thing that is also much more fun as compared to the linear media is the fact that uh, we can never decide where what sounds will play at what moment. So for example, if it's a video that we're working on, an animated video or a film, if at two minutes, 14 seconds, there is a uh, say gunshot, every time the video is played at two minutes, 40 seconds, there will be a gunshot. So from a sound designer's perspective, uh, from a mix engineer's perspective, the aim would be to make sure that it sounds as good as possible and as relevant uh, as possible in the mix. Now, when it comes to games and interactive media, the gunshot could be at any point of time. Uh, you never know if the music is playing at that moment. You never know which specific part of the music is playing at that moment. So there is a, a little more fun uh, element in that regards because you have to see the bigger picture and which is where a very important aspect of pre-production comes in, uh, interactive media, which is also there in linear, but in interactive media, it is much, much more relevant. Uh, and it's not just that a person is working in their, for example, DAW, and they have a specific session and they have their own style of working and all they need to export are the stems, which is the case that we do in films and videos, right? We just export the stems and those audio files is what goes to the rest of uh, the departments for mixing and so on. In interactive media, in games uh, and metaverse and everywhere, we are actually dealing at an individual level at every individual file is what matters so it is much more fun uh, and at the same time it is it involves a lot of collaboration it, it it requires us to have a good understanding of everybody else who who are involved in the pipeline so that, i think that's something that excites me the most uh i mean personally uh but yeah it's also a little bit challenging and yeah that's the fun part 100 percent. so the next part is really how do we kind of approach this and train this, especially if you are coming from um, either film or you've never done any of this before. And this all seems super daunting. So the first thing is really to to observe, analyze, document and learn or the four, four things. So play your favorite games. One of the big things is that when we when we go into games, it's really important to just play a bunch of games, listen to them. What do they sound like? What are they doing? Um, what are the systems? And what can you hear document it write it down this is super important as well online and offline research and learn this next step is really kind of like there's a bunch of different articles on a sound effect on um what's it called uh on wise as, as well blog posts that really outline like how did they do this how did they build these systems so once you kind of like taken one of those games and uh, like Overwatch, for example, and listen to it, play it, see how it works, see what's going on. And then afterwards, you can then see what have they actually done and break it all down. And then you'll you'll probably be surprised that some of the things you've probably guessed right. And I think then trying to potentially even reverse engineer that later on once you have a little bit more of the skills is always super, super good uh, for learning. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, Greg, uh, one thing that I, uh, one analogy that I like to give is uh, try and become the Tarantino of game audio. Uh, like Tarantino has a very good understanding of movies. He has like watched a bunch of movies and he can probably tell you which scene has what camera angle and all that. And I think observation is always a good way to learn anything. So if you, any one of you who are completely new for this domain, pick out any favorite game of yours. Maybe you played in, in your childhood uh, and maybe you did not notice a lot of things. So for example, if you have played Super Mario and I think a lot of people here would have played it already. There are instances in the game that happens which you would have noticed, uh, but I'm not sure if you are thinking from a game audio perspective. So for example, if the timer in Super Mario goes below 100, the music all of a sudden speeds up. And it immediately lets you know that this is the time when you need to hurry. You need to go ahead and finish the uh, stage. Otherwise, the Mario will basically die. And that's how you, the user gets to know that there is an action required from the, their end. But from a game audio implementation wise, as soon as the timer goes below 100, you listen a very nice music like a bridge. Ta -na -ta, ta -na -ta, and then the next fast music of the same track uh, initiates. So small observations, but it can actually enhance your understanding of how you would want to approach uh, a game that you're working on in the future. So yeah, ob observation and documentation, I think are very relevant. And I think this uh, also comes uh, uh, to the point that in game audio, documentation could actually be as like as important as 50% of the whole work. So in film audio, I know documentation mostly is, gets used in terms of budgeting, in terms of deciding who would do uh, how many durations of the video, for example, how many reels would get shared among different uh, studios. But when it comes to games, even small things like watch will be the name of the file is also very relevant. And if you miss that, or if you are not on the same page as everybody else in the team, the audio might be ready from your end, but it would never reach the final game. So I think this will also, this exercise will also help all of you to get into the habit of documentation because I know when we are sound designers, we wouldn't want to like sit and type Excel sheets or Google Docs and all, but trust us, like it's an extremely relevant skill to have, especially uh, in this domain. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that is 100% true. I spend a lot of my days uh, documenting um, asset lists and and how to design systems and we always start on paper yeah but how do we actually hear audio in games so we basically have something called an audio listener which is essentially a virtual pair of ears and we can pretty much have multiple of them which can be weird but you can kind of only hear uh one at a time so we can switch between them and they're often either placed on the camera or the players we have for example audio listener positions here in racing games, you have the chase cam and the cockpit cam. And both of those, as you know, have different sounds. Um, the When we're in the cockpit, the engine is a little bit more muffled. Um, we can probably hear the gear shifts louder, stuff like that. Versus when we're in the chase cam, we can hear the exhaust very loud. Um, we could also have bonnet cam, which is very much in front of the car. So you hear a lot more of the engine and not much of the exhaust. And you can basically switch between those. So this goes into then how do we play back audio in games? Well, we have something called audio emitters and there are two different audio emitter types really. And that's 2D and 3D emitters. So 2D emitters, a way to kind of wrap your head around it, what it is, is basically similar to having headphones on your virtual ears. So that means the sounds are not spatialized, but what does spatialized mean? It's a, it's a interesting, tricky words. So basically, if we hold out our phone and play some music on our phone and we turn our head, then you'll hear the music louder in one ear than the other when we turn our head. Yep. Then obviously, when we put on headphones and turn our head, we we don't, uh, the music doesn't change based on the head movements. So that's basically a 2D emitter. And then a 3D emitter obviously is like a tiny speaker. So like the phone playing uh, in the world that really broadcasts that audio. And they have um, different, so to speak, broadcast ranges. So like in real life, 
depending on how far the sound travels. And that is something we call attenuation, but we'll cover that later as well. But it basically means that if we're Mario in this case, and there's the car engine idling sound, and when we walk close to it, then we'll hear it. And when we walk far away, then we'll stop hearing it. So how does sound get into games though? This is the um, another big question. So sound is first designed and exported in the DW. Then we implement it into WISE and we set up an audio event to trigger that sound. So something needs to, within WISE, say, hello, we wanna, we wanna play this bell sound, ding, ding, ding. Then we want to create something that's called a hook and it's called a hook kind of because, you know, we take that and, and grab it um, in the game engine that triggers that event, which then triggers the sound. And that is done through code animation triggers. So for example, you know, when the foot is, is down uh, on an animation, then we have a footstep sound or something like that volume triggers. So for example, if we go into a, um, into a specific area and and all of a sudden we have a music change um, from, I don't know, a forest to cave or something and box colliders, which is similar. Um, for example, if we if we are a car and we drive into a wall and then we hear a sound, then middleware. Middleware has the building blocks for us to create simple but also really complex systems and enables us sound designers to do loads of things, including prototyping. We can test things with it. We can change the mix. We can create dynamic music. We can also monitor and profile and monitoring profiling um, is basically something where you can see kind of what is happening in your game at the moment, what sounds are playing, where they're playing from, how many sounds are playing, how loud are they, stuff like that. And we can use that information to debug and debug is basically like Again, figuring out if, if there's a bug or something is wrong, like what's happening, why is it going wrong? And all of that we can do without code, which is super amazing because we just have to learn the tool like uh, DW, but we don't have to then dive into all of the code stuff. So that's where WISE and other middleware is so, so, so powerful to us. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, this is a very important point for anybody starting out because uh, I mean, uh, I I think this is, these are the questions that we get often, right? Whenever somebody is getting into game audio, uh, especially people who are specifically uh, into sound design and like not at all into the coding domain, they always have a question that, uh, do we need to learn code? Like, is it compulsory to learn code? And the answer to that is no, you, you basically don't have to. Uh, and which is why middlewares exist. The whole idea is to give you an interface that is so convenient for you and so uh, intuitive that you do all the sound design, all the implementation in the middleware and the middleware would then generate the code for you. The reason for actually learning any middleware is not just like uh, about the using of that middleware in the game that you will work on in the future, but also to actually understand the terms because throughout the gaming industry, there will be some uh, common terminology which would be in which, which, which you will see in every studio. So if a developer has to talk about uh, events, for example, you need to know what event actually means. Uh, the, the fact that events and sound effects are not the same thing is also something which might come as a surprise for anybody who is doing linear media. Uh, so an, an analogy of this uh, in uh, Pro Tools, for example, any, any DAW is you have tracks and every track can be muted and soloed. And when you want to create stems, you basically would solo a few tracks and then export that whole audio. But if you don't specifically know what a stem is, uh, what do you mean by a, uh, like a vo voice stem uh, or how to do that in your software, then it would be very hard to interact with any mixing studios, for example, for films. The same way, if you are aware of middleware, if you are aware of the terms that gets used, uh, the, the concept at least, it would be much, much uh, be convenient for you to then plan on things, uh, be more comfortable when the, uh, the discussions are going on, or even like from your point of view, give suggestions like uh, in terms of game implementation. Maybe you have an idea that is not implemented at all ever anywhere in the world, but for you to be able to communicate that to anybody else, you need to know the language, uh, the language of game like how the events are what events are what sound effects objects are so 
all of that and i think uh, this is something that also uh, uh, is something that people need to get aware of because in the starting when you are learning game audio if you come across something that you are not aware of so for example in the previous slides greg talked about 3d emitter and 2d emitter if these are words that you have never ever heard before or it kind of uh, made you conf- like uh, gave you some confusion and all it's okay to be in that situation it's okay to be uh, in that uh, place where you are not aware of it even though you might have a lot of experience in film and uh, uh, other uh, domains but accepting that there will be some new keywords and any time you come across such keywords you would basically have a mindset that you will go and google about it and search about it and learn that that's also one of the like more important aspect of learning any mid- middleware or any game audio uh, from a learner's perspective rather than a mindset of okay i know films and all i have been like a pro mixing engineer so this all should be all known for me already Uh, there there can be instances where it, it that won't be the case so don't feel bad if you come across situations like that and just try and uh, google about it and you you'll get to know yeah definitely yeah uh, also the reason why i included the big lego um technic image here is because it's it's similar to that kind of like you have the the different like i said building blocks and that's really how you should view it kind of um in wise there's a lot of different little building blocks so to speak that we can create cool systems with so later on when we start to go all into all of that stuff um it's it's a really good way to just look at that is like okay how can we make this fit with this what what do i have to my disposal and this is where we get into designing systems so the first thing is what you really want to start is in your head so like figure out what exactly do you want to happen when does the sound need to play back and it, and also importantly when does it need to stop because if we don't tell it to stop it won't stop um how does the sound need to play back and does it change during the playback uh, during yeah during runtime which is while the game is playing playback and if so how so for example um does the sound need to go down in volume when when the player is further away does uh yeah for example a health bar uh you want you want the sound of the um ambiences for example to go up for some reason when you're low health so stuff like that but then you also need data for that so you need to figure out what data do you need from the game like for example health bar can be a number from 0 to 100 the car rpm so when a car is driving how fast are the wheels are spinning um we need that for the engine for example how much stamina does the player have maybe we want to create a breathing system like in the last of us where when the player um you know runs a lot then they become uh very very exhausted and they breathe more heavily uh, or or when they're standing close to a cliff maybe we want them to to start breathing in a more um rapid and and, and fearful way then we would need the information of okay we're standing close to a cliff blah 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 so stuff like that um and then we want to look for references as well this is one of the hugest most important things uh, a lot of the people who go to university learn this because this is part of the research um but people who who learn themselves um sometimes miss out on it it's really like what are what are other games doing what kind of what systems are they using how do they work um how does it sound how does yeah all of that, that stuff then we want to put it on paper and document it which we already discussed earlier so write down the details draw flow charts like first we do this then we do this and you know if if this yes then this happens if this no this happens and yeah just make it visual visual is drawing stuff makes it really easy for our brains to then have an anchor point to and to be able to figure it out better and to hold it in our memory and then we want to prototype it in wise and test it in the wise soundcaster and all of that is obviously coming later um but yeah it's kind of this picture sums it up perfectly the idea and then kind of the plan and then the action 
I think this this uh, slide, uh, I, people should probably take a screenshot and print it <laughs> because this is going to save them a lot of time. And uh, we always have this tendency to jump the gun, right? Like we always feel like, oh, we, are, we have to design a sound for this visual. Okay, let me just import the video into my DAW and start designing right away. And I think the fact that you need to take a step back, look at the bigger picture, and I think just follow these steps like by staying patient, I think will save you a ton of time in the future when you realize, okay, uh, whatever sounds I have designed actually makes sense in the context of the game. So yeah, I think uh, please do go ahead and take the screenshot of this and uh, make sure to print it out. And especially if you're starting out, yeah, th these steps are going to help you a lot. So fundamentals of wise. Now we're actually going to jump into the more practical part and uh, we're going to look at how to install wise and set it up. Um, look a little bit into the layout and we'll go from um, the journey of adding a sound and then also playing it back and how events work and um, how to create them. So I'll let Krashant share his screen and take it away from here. Uh, awesome. Uh, thanks, Greg. Okay, so I'll just uh, share my screen and you know, run you guys uh, through it. So the first thing is when it comes to Vice, there is a concept of Vice Launcher. And this is basically the company which is audio kinetic they have kind of made it easier for uh, all of the game developer community to uh, keep a track of which version of vice they are using so the first thing that all of us needs to be aware of is that you need to download something called vice launcher and this you will find from uh, audio kinetics website audiokinetic.com and once you download the vice launcher it will probably ask you to log in uh, you can create your account and then basically log in into the uh, launcher. And once you're done with that, go to the Vice uh, uh, menu, and then you will see a bunch of options to install a new version. In my system, if you notice, I have three versions already installed. So uh, maybe if you're doing it for the first time, you won't see any of that. Uh, but all you need to do is click on this install button. And it will basically uh, let you know about the different versions of Vice that is, uh, 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 like the SDK, the offline documentation, these are all optional. What you will definitely need is, is the authoring. The other side, you will see something called deployment platforms. So if you are not aware, Vice actually allows you to create game audio and like export the files for a lot of platforms. So it includes uh, Nintendo, Sony, Mac, uh, uh, Mac applications, uh, Windows applications, Windows games and all that. So based on what platform you want to export to at the moment, you can just select or you can also leave it at none. These are options that you can actually install later on. And that's the whole point of using Vice Launcher. Say if you are using your system to create games that will only be played on Xbox, for example, you don't need any everything else to be cluttering your uh, uh, storage, right? So you can just uncheck everything that you don't need and select only things that you require and then click on next. And it's a very basic step uh, to do the installation. And once you're done with the installations, if you come back to this Vice tab, you will see all of the available versions in your system listed down here. So in my system, I have 2021.1.8, 1.9 and the uh, 2022 beta version. There is also another version of 2022 that is recently launched, but I have not installed it yet. Yes, it is very common to use WISE versions that are not the latest. Um, yeah. It's partially to do with some versions. Uh, if they're new, they might not be stable. They might have bugs in them that... Um, or cause weird things that can't be found so mm -hmm. then teams will spend a lot of time to then only to realize like oh it's something that we can't fix anyway because it's in the software additionally um teams need to have the same wise version so that's why it's really important that the wise launcher lets you have multiple versions installed yeah. um so for example the whole team would then run off the same wise version because if someone runs off a different wise, wise version and then checks in their changes into mm -hmm. Um, the source control, it might cause some very, very weird stuff for other people. Um, so yes, that is super common. Um, yeah. Plugins as well are optional. Um, plugins are same as DAW plugins. Basically, you can mm -hmm. um, choose to use them or not. There are some that are free, others that are not free. So you just need, need to make sure to read up on which ones you can use and which ones you would have to pay licenses for. But I think it's really cool to install them 
and to just try out stuff because yeah it's really good then if you're working with with the team um and you need a reverb and there's different convolution reverbs that you want and you've already tested the wise one and maybe a different one from um another manufacturer uh, that's also available to download then you can already you have a you have a mental comparison of those so it's definitely not a bad idea to install them and to just have a go and to try them out exactly yeah and i think uh, uh, this is also something which is a little bit different from the usual film and uh, like the other in, uh, like linear media because like if you're using a specific daw like if you're using reaper for example you can work on reaper and export the stems and those audio files are what goes to the other person it's never it's very less likely that uh, your whole session itself will go uh, but when it comes to wise there are I, i'll just talk about the work units in, in a second but uh, making sure that everybody is on the same version is extremely important and i think this is something uh, that uh, uh, all of us should also have as a habit uh, when it comes to creating documents so if you are going to work in a game company for the first time and they do not track the wise version you can actually give this that as a suggestion and uh, believe us like you will immediately get a, a good <laughs> response for that because it can often mess things up if you are on the different version so it's similar to using a different version of unity itself so i have seen companies like even in uh, in the games that i have worked with even in 2022 the application the 2019 version of unity was getting used and the whole reason was there were custom codes written specifically for that version which may or may not work in the latest version of unity or unreal so version uh tracking is a very important thing and yeah it, that's a that's a great question to ask actually all right so once we have that installed the next step obviously is to click on launch wise just be aware in this installation that we have done we have not installed any plugins uh we have not installed any other additional add-ons just the authoring like i said we can do all of that later and how you would do is just click on this wrench icon if it's a settings icon and you can just modify your installation or you can all also manage plugins and it's also very important thing like greg mentioned that most of the some of the plugins could be free but some of the plugins could require additional licensing so be very careful when you are going to add plugins especially if you are working with a specific game studio uh, because if they are not uh, in a position to actually license more of the plugins and all you should definitely avoid them and there are actually work arounds that you can do within wise uh, about adding reverb and all that and you won't necessarily require plugins all the time but something to be definitely aware of that by mistake you should not have any plugin that actually is will go is going to cost your studio without actually checking with the studio first so let's actually go ahead and do the first step uh, in my case i'm just going to install version i mean i'm going to launch 2021.1.9 Okay, so the first thing that you would be asked, uh, that would you would be shown, is basically the project launcher, and project launcher is very similar to what you see in most of the DAWs, where you are asked to create a new project, uh, select the location where you want to save, or you would be asked to open an existing one. So in our case, let's just go ahead and click on new, and once you on, you click on the new button, you will be shown another window, which basically is a new project window in which you can decide the name of the project. So let's say this is GAL Wise One Hundred One. GAL is basically the short form of Game Audio Learning. You can select the location where you want the project to be, and this is very important. Uh, we'll also talk about the folder structure that Wise actually creates for you uh, to get a better. So let's. I'm going to just uh, keep everything inside this folder called Game Audio Learning, and if I click on Choose, that is selected. Uh, original files is basically the folder where all of the audio that you send to Wise will be copied to, and we'll we'll take a look at that as well. Platforms is uh, the list of platforms for which you want to build. Uh, so basically, in Wise, uh, like how in DAWs you have you export audio files, uh, in Wise you export sound banks, and it all depends on which platform you are building for. So by default for you it might be showing as Mac or Windows but in case you don't have what you want you can just click on the add button uh and just select the platform that you are building for and you can just select that like for example let me just select Mac and just click okay now i have the option to build for two platforms and this is what the power of wise is with a click of a button you just added a whole new platform 
uh, and if you are basically doing audio coding like on your own you will have to write a whole new script probably now at the end you also have some additional options to add asset groups and all which i'm going to select none because we are not going to use any of the acoustic texture or synth and all that and we can just click okay now vice would take some time uh, and it would basically uh, generate all the folders for us i think if you are launching vice for the first time you might also see a window uh, which would, would mention about the license um, and you, for now you can i think uh, skip that but when you're working with a game studio you might actually receive all that information from the game studio itself uh, greg you want to uh, add something on about that uh yeah i mean i think the the first it's funny because when you work uh with wise and stuff like that the the first installation obviously only happens once usually <laughs> unless you switch machines so um yeah it's 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 one of those things where a lot of the settings will be taken from um if if there's an existing team that you're integrating in obviously they'll have all of the settings ready if you're a freelancer and working with the studio yourself and it's your first time using wise mm -hmm. then it's basically you have to clarify beforehand what platforms do you want to publish to um and then basically as prashant just did add those to um to the to the project options yeah so I think this is the window I was talking about. It would just say license manager. In, in our case, we just click on close. And now comes the interface. Uh, and I think uh, I have this analogy of uh, talking about how do we learn to ri ride a bicycle. And uh, what I would generally prefer to do uh, before even starting to pedal is just like sit on the bicycle and just just get comfortable with it like just maybe tilt it a little bit just to see if i'm confident enough to uh, handle it on my own or like so that in in situations where i'm pedaling and i'm about to fall i am confident that i know how to apply brakes and just put my foot down and actually we still be able to control it so that's what we are going to do now let's actually look at this interface i hope it's clear to you guys on this video stream uh, in case you are uh, doing this step in parallel, you can also take a look uh, on your screen. Uh, the first thing would be to just do some observations. You can see there are some things on the left, uh, some kind of panels. There is something on the middle and there is something on the right. In case your layout looks a bit different than mine, uh, you might want to go to layouts and click on designer. So I'm basically on a designer layout. And in case even then it looks a bit different, you can just go to the last setting inside of the layouts menu called reset factory layouts, select the designer layout and click reset layout. And this way you can be sure that your screen and my screen looks the same. Uh, this is important only at the first step because as and when you start using wise, you will probably have your own way of using wise. So you will you you might have your own way of structuring things like you might have some windows on the left some on the right based on your convenience but just so that we are on the same page in the start this would be a good step to do which is go to layouts go to reset factory layouts reset the designer layout so that your screen and mine looks the same so now we actually see a scary interface it's not actually scary i'm just like joking so let's observe a few things on the top, we see like a project menu. We have something called project. We have like an edit menu. We have views, layouts, profiler, audio, windows, help. Uh, and on the top, like of the window itself, we have the name of our project that we had uh, selected when we were making a new project and also the wise version so that we are 100% sure what version we are working with. And then on the uh, we have an option called platform selector where we can select Mac or whichever additional platforms you had added in the step that we discussed earlier. And then on the left, we have something called project explorer. Now inside this project explorer, you will see multiple sub tabs. Like you see audio events, sound banks, game sync, share sets, sessions, queries. We are not going to touch any of that today. I just want you guys to get comfortable with that. Just be aware that project folder has all of those sub tabs. And they are kind of intuitive. If it's an audio tab, obviously it will have, it would be a location where you add assets, add audio assets. If it is events tab, you'll obviously create events, but what events are, we'll, we'll talk in a bit. So let's actually explore 
the audio tab actually before we go there let's see the middle of the screen we have something called property editor and then we go on the right we see something called master audio bus and we have some kind of meter here which looks a little bit like uh, a daw uh, not exactly the same but you get the point right we have the meter values uh, uh, mentioned here on the bottom we see something called the contents editor and at the very bottom we have some kind of a transport panel which i think most of you would have also seen in any of your doc on the bottom left we have some a tab called property help and below that we have something called event uh, viewer now all of these uh, uh, specific views are actually called views like this project explorer is called the project explorer view this property editor is called the property editor view and the collection of view is what is called layouts so if you go to the menu called layouts you should actually try doing this if you are like doing it in parallel you will notice something called designer layout profiler sound bank mixer so let's just click on the sound bank layout all of a sudden the views are slightly rearranged let's actually do that for uh, say the mixer and if you click on that you see another uh, uh, differently arranged uh, layout so the whole idea is for you to understand that depending on the kind of task that you're going to do in wise wise actually has a set of pre-built layouts that will help you do that particular task faster but you don't have to stick to that layout you can always modify a few windows uh, views here and there as per your convenience and that layout will stay safe let's just get back to the designer layout and this is where we are going to uh, initiate our the first step of adding sounds to wise any questions so far like have you guys also done that observation are you comfortable with that is why still looking scary or something of that sort just wanted to say as well um there's a there's a lot of different layouts and views and screens and all of that but odds are is that most of the time you'll you'll only be using the designer and then a little bit like the profiler um and then very then you need to get get those sound banks out so you'll be tapping over to the sound bank just pressing the buttons and stuff but generally you'll be you'll be most mostly in the designer and um a lot of the things in wise you will never touch until <laughs> a certain point when you will touch them and then you're still like huh how does this actually work and then you'll have to do a quick google and like ah yes that's how it works so don't worry about it um yep. it's yeah you'll, you'll get comfortable as time goes on it's similar like in a daw where there's obviously in in reaper you have the region render matrix and whatnot and in a ableton you have obviously the the two different views as well the timeline and then the i forget what the other views the session view or whatever and so with those as well like at first when you go from another daw into ableton you're like what there's two views and not just the <laughs> timeline that's crazy so it's 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 just all you get used to and you you get comfortable yeah exactly yeah so i think uh, let's quickly now look into the uh, designer layout like greg mentioned this is going to be something that you will be visiting often so it's a good thing to just be aware of the things so inside of designer layout let's check this uh, project explorer view and inside of project explorer view let's check the audio tab see the, there's a reason why i'm very much particular about the words i'm using like views and layouts and all that because these are new terms so what happens sometimes is when we are interacting with different uh, team members especially say in the future when you become a lead of the game department and you have to talk to a junior or who is new to wise it's important that you are on the, speaking the same language so just a few things to like keep in mind Now instead of audio tabs you can see something called audio devices you can see something called master mixer hierarchy you can see actor mixer hierarchy and you can see interactive music music hierarchy uh in this specific today's video we'll just talk about the actor mixer hierarchy and this is basically the place where we deal with a lot of sound effects uh, uh objects when it comes to music obviously we have a specific hierarchy called interactive music now the reason why these exist the reason why there are different versions of it is because wise has been 
designed from a mindset of a sound designer and at the same time the mindset of an implement uh, implementer there are different scenarios that can occur in a game there could be for example a department that is just working with music that's not going to touch anything about the sound effects there would be some departments that are just going to talk about the dialogues the voices and they will never talk about music at all so it's just an easier way to make sure that everybody is able to work independently but at the same time when all of those uh, assets are combined into a single project it's easier for everyone to figure out what thing is where at the same time functionality wise also you will notice that when it comes to interactive music the objects that are available inside of interactive music hierarchy have additional features which are not present in an actor mixer hierarchy so for example if it is music you might have different layers of music you might have an option to loop a part of the music or randomize the position where the music and all starts or the fact that you want to stay in rhythm so you want to sync something in bpm so all of those functionalities would be present in the interactive music hierarchy but you won't find it in the actor mixer hierarchy so just understand that it's all about the implementation and where it makes sense the most uh, thereby avoiding too much information for people who it's not required required for now inside of actor mixer hierarchy you will notice something called default work unit and i think this is one of the most important concept when it comes to uh, learning wise is the concept of work units and work units are basically like an xml file that uh, store information about what you have done and if you are say for example using pro tools or any of the daw which allows you to export sessions uh there is an option to import sessions import tracks from sessions so for example if you are using pro tools and you have saved a pro tools session you can actually open a fresh session of pro tools click on import and select the previous session and instead of opening that completely you can just select a few tracks that you want to uh, to have in this particular session right the same way inside of games like when we are working on the sound design there could be say six sound designers working on the single game there can actually be six studios working on a single game you, the the limit is uh, uh, endless and in that case every studio and every sound designer would have their own way of doing some things and at any point of time you don't want any overlaps because when it comes to budgeting when it comes to integration you want to be sure where thing is going missing so work units allow us to basically have all that information in one place and i think this will make much more sense if i actually show you the folder structure that gets created when wise creates this folder for you when uh, this fold project folder for you so if you see your own system or if you are following along inside this gal wise 101 folder wise has created so many of subfolders you will see a project file which is called galwise101.wproj this is the main project file that uh, wise opens and there are a lot of subfolders in which you have a subfolder called actor mixer hierarchy inside of which you have a default work unit .wwu and actually if you open this wwu file inside of any text editor you will be actually able to see the xml file Uh, don't mess it up because then wise might not be able to read it but that will but do open it for just just for fun just so that you know it's nothing like tricky and it just stores the information that you have so that's the whole point of uh, work units now inside of work unit when you click on the work unit this is where you start adding objects so now if you see if i select the work default work unit on the top a few buttons get highlighted like if i unselect it deselected all of them are like uh, inactive but if i select it again all of them become active and one of them which has the speaker icon if you hover over it it says create new sound effects and if i click on that it allows you me to just add like type a name and it is uh, basically giving a default name called new sound effects so let's just call it gunshot now basically gunshot here is a sound sfx object it does not have any audio file in it it is just an object which will hold the audio file so this is an another concept that i think we need to understand when it comes to any game audio engine the audio file 
actually goes and sits inside of an object uh, and the uh, anal- analogy of this with your uh, uh, linear media would be uh, say in your DAW you have tracks and tracks is where you import all the audio files and when you play back the whole track whatever audio is there in that track gets played right uh, like in, in sequence but track is the entity that actually is holding the audio file in it. It could actually hold like the full audio file or maybe a part of it. And you could have crossfades and all that, whatever is whatever you want to do. But at the end, the track is the entity that is going to hold the audio file. So kind of in a similar way, the sound SFX object is the object that is going to have a, 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 a way for you to import sound effects to it. Uh, does that make sense? It's basically like a container. Yeah. And the sound F- SFX object is one of the containers that we can put audio into basically. And there's different types of containers, which we won't go into today, yeah. but we'll go into in further lessons. And those containers are a bit like the, the Lego blocks, which allow us to build those systems basically. So exactly. Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, even when I was learning uh, like Vice uh, and like middleware in general in the start, even in Unity and Unreal, this is a concept that kind of uh, went above my head because uh, I was like, okay, I have a, created an object. I, uh, why doesn't it play any sounds? And uh, I think this is a very important thing to understand when it comes to uh, any game audio uh, engine or any middleware. This is a common concept throughout that you will have containers and those containers actually have functionalities which is why it is approached this way and those containers is where you will add your uh, actual audio file so let's just actually do it inside of the gunshot let me add audio files and there are multiple ways of doing it you can right click this gunshot container scroll down to something that says import audio files uh, the shortcut is shift i and please remember the shortcuts in vice it will it's going to save you a ton of time and when you click on that Vice basically shows you a window in which if you see on the top, it says add files, add folders or import tab delimited, which is basically uh, uh, an option for you to add uh, a file which has the information of other files and all that. So, but let's just click on this option, which says add files. So when you click on add files, Vice would basically prompt you to go to the folder, any folder in your system, which has any audio uh, and just select that. If you click on add folders, it has actually a little more functionality. Uh, Vice actually helps you automate a bunch of things. So for example, if you have one folder uh, called footsteps in which there are multiple files, you can actually import all of those files uh, at once inside of a different type of container, not the sound SFX container, which we will talk about in a future session. But today we are just going to focus on add files. And as soon as my system starts lagging and actually shows the prompt uh, we should be good to go uh, until then uh, greg anything you want to add to that keyboard shortcuts is a good one so obviously we're not focusing on that right now but yeah. in general um learning learning keyboard shortcuts is good and i think i also just wanted to say here there's no with with wise and similar with DAWs and stuff there's multiple ways of doing things so with within a DAW, you could, you could have a bus if you want to put reverb on something you could have a bus and then send send the track to the bus to have reverb. You could put the reverb directly on the sound. You could put on the track. There's multiple ways of doing it. It's a similar in wise. There's multiple ways of doing yeah. a lot of different things from from a system design standpoint, but also just importing audio. Like you can drag and drop it. You could use a soundly wise integration. You could use the command shift I and import it and things like that. But basically, um, at the end of the day, it's kind of like get comfortable with, with what works best for you. Um, exactly. Do it in that way. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think uh, if, also, if, if there's questions, now is a great time to ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, I think you, you might notice that we are going way too slow when it comes to uh, talking about game audio, like uh, what Greg presented in the starting and what we are going seeing in Wise as well, because that's the whole aim. Because we know when it comes to beginners, uh, there could be a, a friction when it comes to learning something new. And we want to make sure that we make it as comfortable as possible. So in case you find uh, you have any questions in between, please uh, feel free to just drop it in the chat and we'll make sure to pause and clarify it for you and then uh, move forward. Plus my system lags anyway. So 
So basically, uh, I b have uh, selected the sound and actually imported one of the sound uh, using that import file option. Like Greg mentioned, there are multiple ways of importing sounds. So it's up to you to get convenient with that. Uh, but there's something to notice that once you create a sound as effects object for the first time, and if it does not have any audio inside of it, it will look like in red color. And once you have an audio added to it, it will look blue. So this is also a, a good way inside of Wise to let you know if some an audio file is missing, uh, because especially when you're working with hundreds and thousands of audio effects, this could be a situation where you are expecting a sound to get played inside of the game, but you're not listening. So you should always do this check. Just just do a quick rundown, see if the, anything is in red, and that's a, uh, like a good way to know if uh, you missed uh, a specific sound. So actually, uh, while we are at uh, that, let's just quickly select one of the sound SFX object in which we added the sound. And once you select it, this transport control will get active and you can just click on the play button. The idea here is, like I mentioned, uh, inside of Mac, Wise is basically like uh, uh, done inside of a wine bottle and all that. So you might notice things like if you have like a bunch of uh, sound effects, uh, sorry, sound SFX objects and you click on one and then you immediately click on the next one. Uh, you might see that both of them get selected at the same time. Uh, so if it is happening for you, uh, what I would suggest is just command click on one of the sound SFX object and then click on it again. And then I think that should work. Uh, I don't think this happens inside of Windows, but th this definitely happens in Mac. So nothing to worry about. There's nothing wrong with your system. It's just the way it is. Uh, and I think in the uh, native version of Vice, this, this should be uh, taken care of. So again, like uh, just now I created a new sound SFX object and you can see the one at the bottom is in red and the top one is in blue, which just means that the sound sound SFX object does not have any audio attached to it yet, which we'll do now and we'll do it in a different way. So this time I'm basically going to use uh, Soundly for it. So let me just uh, click, uh, let's say magic want uh, okay so I can just select any of the sounds that I prefer and I can click this button and the same thing happens uh, soundly basically lets me uh, either send the sound to that specific object that I had selected in Vice, which we had named as sound or maybe create a new sound SFX object. And I'm actually going to use this new sound SFX object because I want to show you guys the concept of different work units. And let's just name this sound as magic ting because that's what the sound is and click on okay. And once I do that, uh, Soundly will basically send the sound back to Wise. And let's observe a few things here. So it, now if you notice, we have inside of actor mixer hierarchy, we actually have two work units. One is the default work units that we were working in so far in which we added two sound SFX objects. One is called new sound. Another one is called sound. New sound is blue because it has audio file inside of it. Sound is red because we are yet to add anything to it. And we also see another work unit, which is called soundly. And inside of that, we see a sound SFX object called magic thing, which is in blue which basically means Soundly has also added a sound, an audio file to that specific uh, sound SFX object. Now, this is what we were talking about, that if you're working with different teams, they would be working in different work units. And the cool thing about WISE is that you can share work units with different uh, teams and then they all they have to do is just import it to their uh, product session. So in that case, without having to worry about their own integration that they have done. They can be comfortable that whatever assets are coming in from the other studio or from the other sound designer will not affect in any way uh, whatever they have done in their own session. And that's the whole point of uh, the work unit uh, in, in general. I now, want to add to that as well. So when you're working with a studio um, and you have multiple sound designers, we have something called source control, which some of you may know what it is, others isn't. Essentially, it's a way for us to be um, send files back and forth to synchronize so mm -hmm. that we're, when, when I change something in my Y session and then upload it, so to speak, to source control, 
Crashank can then download that, and then it's automatically in his Wise session. Yeah. Um. So it synchronizes. So then the other thing is that we can also lock work units that way. So basically, it's the same as a bike lock. You can't use the bike. So basically, if Prashant is working in soundly work unit, then he can lock it, and then I can't touch it. So what that means is that if we both work on it at the same time, and then we upload it, then it doesn't know which version to choose. And then we have something called a merge conflict. This is going a bit deep in here, but what what we're saying is basically that that's why you have different work units, and that's the whole purpose of splitting it out, is so that I can work in, you know, gun number one, and then Prashant can do work in gun number two, and we can figure out, okay, um, you know, today I'm going to work on this, um, and I'm going to lock it so you can't touch it, and then if he says, oh, I need to do something in this, can you, you know... Uh, upload it for me and unlock it and stuff like that and so that that way we can still kind of like split it out into so that we don't block each other additionally if there's a little star next to the work unit or to a sound or something like that yeah. that means that uh, you haven't saved and you've made a change and so that's really important as well so make sure to save your work um, and you need to save stuff usually before you for example um, export a export a sound back or something you can see here there's a little star so that's really important as well and when you save that in source control and it automatically locks then that's another thing to be wary of so you just want to always make sure like oh, okay what what's what have i touched what what am i going to save yeah and actually let's just also look at the folder uh inside of the actor mixer hierarchy you will notice that a new soundly dot ww file is created which is again just the uh, uh the the work unit file and you can actually have as many work units as you like there is no restriction on that so but just be aware of what the purpose of this is also one thing to notice is what we are calling these objects okay now you can see the bug i selected a new sound but sound 2 is also staying selected this only happens in mac so you just command click on one of the sounds uh, till it gets unselected and then you can just do a reselection. All right, so one thing to be aware of is the container type. Like Greg mentioned, there are a lot of types of container when it comes to Vice and any uh, game audio basically. So we need to know the name of that container type. In this specific example, it is called sound SFX. And it's very important to know this full word. So you just cannot say I have an SFX object or I have a sound object or I have an audio object. It's a best practice to just actually say the whole thing, the sound SFX object, because then you can be 100% sure that the developer that you're working with, the game designer that you're working with, or anyone within the audio department that you're working with actually knows what you're referring to. So for example, when it comes to a DAW, you might say track, you might say an aux track, you might say plugins or slot, a lot of things are there like that, uh, which are used interchangeably. When it comes to Vice in specific, uh, as much as you can, it's better to just stick to the terminology that's, that exists so that everybody is on the same page. Now, there are a lot of different varieties of uh, uh, objects when it comes to Vice. So there is random container, which as it mentions, you can add multiple sound SFX object inside of it. And when you play the random container, any one of those sounds will get triggered. There is something called sequence container which can actually have a, a multiple sound SFX object inside of it and you can define the sequence, sequence in which it will play. One of the example of that would be say a gunshot where the fire happens and then the bullet just falls like flies away from the uh, gun and then falls on the ground. So those sounds have to play in sequence, right? Uh, so all of those can be done in sequence container and there are many more types of uh, possibilities that is that are there. The whole idea is Every container has properties that are relevant to a specific type of implementation. So the more you are aware of different types of container, the better you will get in terms of planning the implementation. Like for example, at this level, like we are going to wrap the session in a while, uh, but with just this much information, if you think that sound SFX object is the only type of uh, object inside of WISE, 
then your whole game session would audio session would be just full of sound effects objects which does not make any sense so yeah so that would be the next step where we go through different types of uh, objects inside of wise we figure out how it works but i think for today uh, we will we'll wrap it up here because we are also like almost at uh, past the time uh, and the the main idea is for you to get comfortable with wise make sure that you have installed it get comfortable with the concept of work unit please open the work unit files inside of your text editor do the hacks let your session get messed up it's okay it's anyways not a triple a game right now right mess it up but take a look at the work unit file and you'll get a lot more information about what it does same way add your sound effects to a dummy session create multiple work units share it with, with your friend who is also learning in this uh, in today's session see if you guys are able to find a way to import each other's work unit or maybe explore like greg mentioned uh, version control uh, applications like github or perforce or anything just explore that see what actually works out and what actually happens in your session the idea is to mess up your session please don't worry about the sound that comes out please don't worry about uh, the accuracy of the like the beauty of the sound design is it is it good enough for a marvel game and all <laughs> it's that's not the point anyway just make sure that you know what a sound effects object is how you can import audio to it and what are the what what all is present inside of sound effects object so maybe that that could be also a part of the homework the practical tasks, as yeah, Prashant already mentioned, for this one, really, it will be to kind of analyze one game in depth and write down how some of the systems work, or try and figure out and write it down, and then try and find a blog post about it on a sound effect, um, and and see if they have anything written about how the sounds were implemented and the systems and stuff. And then the second thing is add some sounds to Wise. Um, and connect them to an event or uh, now you don't need to connect them to an event. We've gone a bit long on today's session, so we'll we'll cover that next time. But basically just add some sounds into the SFX object container. Um, so for example, a uh, yeah, gunshot or something like that, just as, we, as we've done today and just get yourself familiar with WISE. Lastly, I just wanted to say that this is our first time doing this. Um, obviously our plan is to, to have ongoing sessions. So, um, we would love to hear your feedback and how we can improve as well. Um, and yeah, we like like we said, this is a, this is an ongoing series, so um, we'll get a lot more in depth with all of the knowledge. We totally know that this is very much scraping the surface at the moment, but we just wanted to lay a really good groundwork for people um, who have never ever thought about anything like game audio before thank you so much everyone for coming we'll make sure that next time we don't have a reduced cap i need to figure out how we're going to do that whether we're going to do it in a different call or a stream or something but um yeah we're we're gonna try and make that happen but yeah thank you so much have a great rest of your weekend and a lovely rest of your sunday thanks bye, everyone. everyone bye